Hi everyone. Hope you're all having a good day today so far. Uh, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, alternative norms and metrics. Uh, so what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to go back to something that we did way back toward the beginning of the course in one of the earliest lectures where we defined the length or the norm of a vector in Rn uh, and note that that was a function because that's going to show up throughout what we do today. That norm was a function from vectors in Rn, takes vectors in Rn into non-negative real numbers. And then we define the idea of the distance between vectors in a natural, obvious way as just the, uh, dif the distance between a pair of uh, vectors x and y, just the norm of x minus y vector or y minus x didn't make any difference. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to define some different norms, some alternative norms on Rn. And in fact, we'll define things in a way that those norms, that we can also define alternative norms on other vector spaces, which will be important because we've seen already that there are lots of vector spaces uh, that are important to us that we'll use that aren't Rn. And so we're going to see how we can define alternative norms on Rn or on other vector spaces that aren't Rn. And then we'll define the notion of distance between vectors in the same natural way. The, the distance between a pair of vectors is the norm of the difference between the two vectors. And then we'll go on to spend a little time at the end of the lecture to talk about alternative metrics, alternative notions of distance that don't come from a norm. So they're not, the distance is not defined as the norm of the difference between two vectors. So that's where we're going today. And so uh, let's get started. So let's start out by recalling, by remembering uh, what it was we did uh, back uh, in one of our earliest lectures where we defined the norm of a vector. And so let's look at the norm that we defined there, which was, we defined this norm to be the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of the vector. And that was the norm, but you'll recall that I uh, kind of went out of my way to say that this is something we call the Euclidean norm. And I said that we do that because uh, we, there are other norms that we use, and that's what we're going to see today. And so uh, let's, before going on to other norms, let's actually go back and see what it was that we did with the Euclidean norm, because we're going to do the same thing with, same things with these other new alternative norms. So what we did was we had our definition. We then proved uh, this theorem that just laid out four properties of the norm, uh, n1 to n4. And then we defined the notion of distance uh, as the distance between two vectors x and y is just the norm of the difference vector, x minus y or y minus x doesn't make any difference. And then we showed, and how we did this is, again, something that's going to run throughout what we do today. The way we did this was to say that um, this theorem was to say that because the norm satisfies these four conditions n1 to n4, we can use just those conditions n1 to n4 to then prove these four conditions or properties of the distance function. So these properties of the distance function came directly from nothing but just n1 to n4. And in fact, they were really just reinterpretations of the properties n1 to n4. Even the triangle inequality, which took a little effort to prove we needed to do the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality first, took a little effort to prove in the case of the norm 
when we got to the distance and its triangle inequality, D4, that was just uh, kind of a two-line proof using the triangle inequality up here. It came from nothing but n1 to n4. So that's what we did uh, for the Euclidean norm, the, only, the norm that we did then. Then when we, uh, actually when I first talked about the Euclidean norm, uh, oh, by the way, I left out one of the vertical lines here. <laughs> okay. Uh, when we first talked about that Euclidean norm, I actually said as an aside that we see other norms. And I even, I believe, defined, wrote down a definition of an alternative different norm. And that was the max norm. And that's defined uh, to be the maximum of the uh, absolute values of the components of the vector x. A couple things to notice. One is that uh, now that I have a different norm here, I'm going to want to, let's take the little colon out of there. I like to have the colon in there, but it kind of at this point it, it actually uh, makes it hard to see the two. So I'm going to now say the Euclidean norm. I'm actually going to put a little subscript to indicate that this norm is the Euclidean norm with the two on it. This one with the infinity symbol is the max norm. And let's even write over here that this is called the uh, max norm. In both cases, on Rn, because again, just like this was a function that assigned to vectors in Rn a non-negative real number, this is a function that assigns to vectors in Rn a non-negative real number. And so, uh, let's notice a couple things. Let's first, uh, let's first uh, take our definition and theorems over here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change nothing but the definition of the norm to this definition here. So the right-hand side, well, the left-hand side will now have an infinity symbol down at the, the subscript, and the right-hand side will have this in place of the square root. And you can see that I changed nothing else on the screen over here. The theorem is exactly the same theorem, except now it's a theorem about this new, different uh, norm, and we have to prove it for this norm. We have to go and do the same things we did for the Euclidean norm, but we do the same things, and easy to prove, uh, the properties n1 to n4 for the max norm. And Again, let me make this point that we don't have to reprove the theorem down here because if we define distance to be the distance between two vectors to be the norm of the vector's difference, x minus y or y minus x, then the proof that we gave for this theorem earlier, beginning of the course, for the Euclidean norm, that proof used only the four properties n1 to n4. So since the max norm we now show in this theorem satisfies the properties n1 to n4, automatically this theorem is going to apply to that as well. So we get these four properties for distance with the max norm. So I think it would be useful at this point to see how these two norms differ geometrically. So Let's draw down here. Let's say that this is the uh, zero vector, and let's say this is the vector x over here. And you can, I'm not going to draw the uh, coordinate system here, but we have a x1 coordinate system, an axis goes this way, and an x2 uh, axis goes this way for the two components because we're in R2 here. So I've just got x1 squared plus x2 squared, maximum absolute value of x1 and x2. And so, of course, 
the Euclidean norm, or we could actually call it the Pythagorean norm, is just this distance, this measurement here, and so let me write that here as, and now I'm going to put a little two down here because this is the, this distance here is the Euclidean norm. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a right triangle here. I'm going to turn this into a right triangle. And again, since this is the zero vector, the origin, this is the x1 component axis and the x2 component axis. So which is the larger here, x1 or x2? x1 is bigger than x2 for this particular example with this x. And so this distance here is the norm of the vector x in the max norm. So this is the max norm of the vector x. This is the Euclidean norm of the vector x. You might guess that we could then do a norm with, the, with this other leg of the right triangle. That wouldn't quite be right, but it's not too far off. So, in fact, let's do a third norm, and let's make that norm. I'm going to put a 1 as the subscript that names this norm, and that is going to be the sum of the absolute values of the components instead of the maximum of the absolute values of the components, and that is called the taxicab norm. It's also called, this norm actually has several different names that people use interchangeably. It's also called the Manhattan norm. It's also called the city block norm. And there may actually be other names people know it by. I don't know because it's, it's uh, as we'll see, uh, these names are very descriptive. And so you could come up with other descriptive names that would fit as well. So uh, let's go back to the geometry to see how this relates to the other two norms geometrically. And then we'll also go over and look at our theorems. In fact, let's do that first. Let's just go over here and let's move this ahead. And you'll notice that what happened when I did that was, again, the only thing that changed was on the left-hand side, it changed from the max norm with the infinity subscript to the uh, city block norm with the one subscript. And then on the right-hand side, it changed from the maximum of the absolute values of the components to the sum of the absolute values of the components. And again, everything else on the screen stayed exactly the same, no change. And that's because this theorem about the norm uh, holds for this definition of a norm also. That is, we can prove as yet another theorem, a third theorem about norms, because it's a third norm, we can prove that this norm satisfies all four of the properties n1 to n4. And again, this theorem, we don't have to prove this theorem because, uh, well, we have to prove it in the sense that it, it, it requires some kind of proving, but the proving goes back to what we did in that earlier lecture where we only used n1 to n4 and nothing else to get d1 to d4. And since here the taxicab Manhattan norm satisfies n1 to n4, this theorem is automatically going to be satisfied again. So, uh, so each of the three norms kind of behaves in exactly the same way. Let's come back to the geometry and see how this norm differs geometrically or visually from uh, the other two norms. Well, the norm is the sum of the absolute values of the components. And of course, notice that in my little diagram, my little example, both components of this x vector are positive. Positive here, positive here. If I'd drawn it the other way, I would have to actually use absolute values. Here, I could just say it's the sum of the, the values because 
the absolute value is the number itself. And so the sum of the two components, x1 and x2, their absolute values, is obviously going to be the sum of this distance plus this distance. So this is the norm of the vector x in this norm. So now we can see how the three norms compare. Uh, each one is uh, defined, in effect, geometrically by something having to do with the right triangle formed by x and the origin, the zero vector. Oh, let's do one other thing here, and let's note that this is all going to work the same if this is uh, any vector. So let's take off, let's just change this to y. And of course, y could be the zero vector, but y could be another vector. And then it's going to be the case the distance between x and y is going to be, this is the distance between x and y according to the Euclidean norm. This is the distance between x and y according to the uh, max norm. And this is the distance between x and y according to the city block norm. So now I think you can kind of see uh, why it is that this might be called the city block norm or the taxicab norm. Uh, so the distance between x and y, if I want to go from x to y, or let's say from y to x, uh, this Euclidean distance is the distance, as we say in a kind of an English saying, this is the distance as the crow flies. So, if I were a crow, and I could fly, then this would be the distance I would have to fly to get from y to x, or from x to y. But, if this is a city, and here's the map of the city, and this is sitting down here on the map, and I want to get from point y to point x in the city with buildings all around and streets going east, west, north, south, I want to get from y to x or x to y, I can't go as the crow flies, I can't fly. I'm going to have to go on the street. I can walk, I can take a, a taxi, uh, but I've got to go on the street, so I've got to go here and here. So the distance between x and y, y and x, is going to be the sum of these two numbers of city blocks. So you can see why we would, it's natural to call this a, the city block metric. And in fact, uh, the reason it's called the Manhattan metric is because in Manhattan, most of the streets run north, south, east, west. It's a grid. And so people have called it the, Ma the Manhattan norm. And in fact, that's really not a very good name because if you've ever spent much time in Manhattan, as I have, uh, you would know that there are a lot of streets in Manhattan that don't run north, south, or east, west. Broadway runs right up through at an angle. You go down to the, to the uh, lower Manhattan, there are streets going every which way down below Greenwich Village. And so calling it the Manhattan norm, and actually it's even worse because the island of Manhattan is kind of oriented southeast, southwest to northeast. So the streets, they're running a grid, but they don't even run north and south but they do run as a grid for the upper part of Manhattan. So it would be more appropriate, actually, to call this the Chicago norm, because if you've ever spent much time in Chicago, again, as I have, uh, you would know that the streets in Chicago almost all run exactly east, west, and north, south. Uh, and they're even numbered in such a way that it's kind of almost exactly like the Euclidean plane uh, with the numbers on the streets. Uh, and actually, even here in Tucson, uh, where I am as I record these lectures, uh, the streets here almost all run east, west, and north, south. So you could call it the Tucson norm. Uh, and in fact, 
I have uh, just been told that <laughs> the same is true in Beijing. So we could have called this the, the Beijing norm, where again, apparently, I haven't been to Beijing yet, but I'm told that in Beijing, the streets almost all run east-west, north-south. So, and of course, there are a lot of cities where that's true, especially in the Midwest of the United States. That's pretty, pretty common. But in any case, people don't know, some, don't know as much about Tucson or Beijing or Chicago as they do about Manhattan, perhaps, at least when this idea was invented. And so, Manhattan norm. You use Manhattan norm, people know what you're talking about. You use Tucson or Beijing or Chicago norm, they'll say, well, huh? <laughs> so, so, um, so, in any case, Manhattan, city block, Beijing, taxi cab norm. So what we've done here should be very reminiscent of something that we did earlier in course uh, when we talked about vector spaces. If you recall, what we did there was we, we, at that point, we kind of went back to one of the very first lectures, perhaps the very first lecture that we did, um, where in Rn we defined the sum of two vectors, and we defined the scalar multiplication of a vector, uh, and we defined it component-wise, which was simple and important for getting this theorem here. And so, from the definition of vector addition and scalar multiplication, we could easily derive each of these eight properties that vector addition and scalar multiplication satisfy. So, this is a theorem about as it says, about addition and scalar multiplication of vectors in Rn. Then what we did when we started talking about vector spaces was that we began to see some additional situations, uh, some additional sets together with a pair of operations that would be like vector addition and like scalar multiplication, uh, where in those sets with those operations, the same results, the same theorem uh, was satisfied. Let's actually, uh, I guess we can leave this on here. Let's uh, just recall what exactly we did do there. We said we looked at the set of all real valued functions on any arbitrary domain set capital X and we define vector addition and scalar multiplication of those functions, component-wise, in effect, point-wise. And so, uh, with that definition of vector addition and scalar multiplication, these functions became like vectors in the sense that we could substitute f of x for rn in every, one, every place in this theorem, which is why I highlighted the rn. We could plug in f of x for Rn in each of these places and prove that this theorem holds for f of x and the two operations of adding functions, real, va real valued functions, and multiplying a real valued function by a scalar. We did the same thing then for R infinity, which was the set of all sequences of real numbers. Again, defining the addition of sequences, term-wise, component-wise, and defining the scalar multiple of a sequence, component-wise or term-wise. And then we showed, very simply, I don't think we really spent any time doing it, I'm not even assigned it as an exercise, we showed that we could plug R infinity in for Rn in each of these eight conditions, and all eight conditions hold. So, this theorem holds for Rn, as we found in the first or second lecture in the course, and it also holds for the set of all real valued functions on any set. It holds for R infinity, and then we also actually went on and we used the set that we called S at the time, the set of all solutions of a system of homogeneous linear equations, and we found that that set too was when, of course, vector addition, scalar multiplication were still defined the same way they were in Rn because these were equations in Rn. Uh, 
And so we found that that set S, the set of solutions, also satisfied all eight conditions. So that meant while it was a subset of Rn, it, that subset, with its, the, 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 the operations from Rn, it satisfied these conditions. So it was a vector space as well. So each of these, each of these uh, sets and their operations satisfied all these conditions. And then I guess I jumped ahead when I said it was a vector space because then what we did was we said, well, look, we've got Rn, but we've got all these other situations where the theorem holds also. So what we said we would do, and we did when we talked about vector spaces, we said, we'll replace Rn, not by this or this or this, we'll replace it by a capital V, which represents a set V of some kind. And it could be this, could be this, could be this, could be Rn. And we, of course, also are assuming in this definition that we have a pair of operations, vector addition, scalar multiplication, and we simply said, we, we call this elevating. So we elevated these eight properties that Rn and these other sets with their operations all satisfy. We said, let's elevate that to a definition and we'll say that anytime we have a set V with two operations that satisfy these eight properties, that we will call a vector space. And the value in that is that now whenever we encounter a set V of any kind, could be Rn, but these are definitely not Rn, this is a subset of Rn. When we encounter any set V with operations that uh, together satisfy these conditions, then any result that we have proved already or can prove that comes, any result that comes just from these eight properties and nothing else, that will be a result that will apply to any vector space. will apply to this, this space, this space, and other spaces that we, I think we've already encountered one or two, and we'll encounter a couple more in, in our lecture today before we get done. So that is a quick review of what we did back when we talked about vector spaces. We'll notice that the same thing is going on here, where we have, uh, we started with our Euclidean norm, got our theorem, n1 to n4, forget for a moment about the distance part, and then we went to our uh, max norm and we showed that satisfies n1 to n4. We went to our uh, taxicab norm, our city block norm, and showed that it satisfies these four conditions here. And so actually as an aside, let me just say, well, I'll come back to that aside in just a minute so I make sure I don't forget it. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do the same thing we did for vector spaces. We're going to elevate these four properties, n1 to n4, to a definition. We're going to say that uh, now, Anytime we have a, a vector space, it doesn't even have to be Rn. All of these were defined on Rn. But anytime we have a vector space uh, and we can define a function that goes from the vector space to non-negative real numbers and that function satisfies n1 to n4, we're going to call that a norm on the vector space. And any results that we can prove um, that about such a function, that any results that come from just the properties n1 to n4 and nothing else, those are results that apply to any vector space and can be applied any time we encounter a vector space and something that would qualify as a norm. And in fact, remember how I emphasized that the distance that we defined from the norm how D1 and D4, we obtain those just from N1 to N4 and nothing else. So this actually is the first instance of uh, this idea for the norm. This idea that once we have the notion of a norm and its properties, that then any time we come up with another function from a vector space 
to a non-negative reals that has these four properties, it will be a norm. And therefore, for that norm, we automatically can define distance in this way here, and d1 to d4 will automatically apply because we have a result that applies to any norm right here, d1 to d4. So this is an excellent example of this kind of powerful idea that we've talked about, how we can elevate properties that we can show for one context or situation that we find applying to other similar contexts or situations, we can elevate those properties to a definition that then can be used to prove general results that will apply any time we see uh, this concept arising. In this case, the norm. In the earlier case, the vector space. And we're going to see another one later in this lecture called a metric space. Oh, and I said I, I was going to point out a little aside here, and that is that uh, these other two norms actually do show up a lot. Um, and let me just indicate, uh, first let me indicate that this one here, I have actually used this norm uh, more than once in uh, papers that I have written and published uh, on experiments. So in describing and analyzing the data from an experiment, uh, it has turned out that this norm has been uh, extremely useful. Let me also point out about this norm that uh, this norm is one that we're going to use actually a lot in situations where we're going to generalize it to the supremum instead of the max, but we're going to use it a lot in situations where we have infinite dimensional vector spaces, unlike Rn, which is, of course, n-dimensional, finite-dimensional. We're going to see this when we have infinite dimensional vector spaces uh, where uh, some other norms, uh, like this one and this one, can't really be defined, but we can define a generalization of this uh, that's called the soup norm. And in fact, we're going to see two examples of exactly that uh, uh, a little later in this lecture.